Yeah. All right. Thank you. Oh, he's on the didn't know you were cheering. Otherwise. No, I'm just pinch hitting until he's here. Gotcha. The committee will come to order. Without objection, all members may have five days to submit statements, questions, and extraneous materials for the record, subject to the length limitation in the rules. This morning, the committee will examine the national and international security implications of climate change. I'd like to welcome our witnesses uh, and welcome members of the public and the press as well. I'll just give a, a brief uh, Opening remark uh, shared with uh, uh, the chairman of the committee, Mr. Engel, who will be here momentarily, um, but in convenience to the witnesses and members, uh, will begin now. Uh, I'll be doing this uh, because our committee, our subcommittee, deals with global environmental issues in foreign affairs. So let me uh, begin uh, with the shared remarks that I have with the chairman. Now the national security concerns tied to climate change are nothing new to the United States government. In fact, government researchers across disciplines and across administrations of both parties have been taking a hard look at this challenge for decades. It was all the way back in 1988 that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was established. In 2003, the Pentagon commissioned a report to examine how an abrupt change in climate would affect our defense capabilities. Its authors concluded that it should be evaluated beyond a scientific debate to a U.S. national security concern. It was uplifted to that level more recently in 2012 and 2014. The Department of Defense Climate Change Ad uh, Adaption Roadmap stated that climate, climate change can serve as, quote, an accelerant of instability or conflict, unquote. That could have a significant geopolitical impact and contribute to poverty, environmental degradation, the weakening of fragile governments and food and water scarcity. In December 2017, the GOP-led Congress passed the defense bill that was signed into law with language stating that, quote, climate change is a direct threat to our national security of the United States, unquote. And just this past January, the National Intelligence Director delivered a worldwide threat assessment that, quote, climate hazards, unquote, include extreme weather, wildfires, droughts, acidification of the oceans, threatening infrastructure, health, water, and food security. Now, what are the real world implications of all these assessments and warnings? What does our warming global uh, our warming globe actually look like. Intensifying food and water insecurity, population flows related to migration, displacement and planned relocation, the inability of fragile states to anticipate and mitigate the impacts of climate change, increased need for disaster relief and humanitarian assistance, great power competition resulting from the diminishment of Arctic sea ice and heightened conflict with and among states. These are problems that would generally demand the full focus of American foreign policy. You'd think that getting at the root cause of such an alarming list of issues would be a major priority. The rest of the world thinks so. Every other country on this planet is party or signatory to the Paris Agreement aimed at curbing the greenhouse gases that drive climate change. The only country to announce its intention to walk away from that deal is, of course, the United States. To justify this misguided decision, the White House recently allowed, announced plans to create an ad hoc group of select scientists to reassess the government's analysis of climate science. After years and years of federal research that makes clear, makes a clear and strong case that climate change is a serious threat, the Trump administration is now desperately seeking to undermine the conclusions that the continued burning of fossil fuels is harming the planet and putting our nation's security at risk. It's just astounding. It's bizarre. It's rare to see every country in the world 
rally around an issue, but there's one idea that just about everyone is aboard on. It's absolutely imperative that we grapple with the challenge of climate change, that the future of our very world and American national security depends on the actions that we take today, that we owe to future generations so that we don't turn our back on the tide and we prevent that list of horrible consequences. Just about everyone, that is, except certain members uh, of one party in the United States, feels that way. And as a result of this small cabal with their heads planted firmly in the sand, the United States has rejected the clear science, ignored the growing threat, and walked away from its role as a global leader on this issue. I can't help but wonder, 30 or 50 or 100 years down the road, when people look back at this era, what they'll be saying about the way the United States dealt with this problem, I don't think it'd be very kind. I'm entering into the record a letter signed by 58 former senior military and intelligence officials to the president warning him that imposing a political test on reports issued by the science agencies and forcing a blind spot onto the national security assessments that depend on them will erode our national security. It's dangerous to have national security analysis conform to politics. Two of those officials, Admiral Dennis McGinn and Deputy Undersecretary Sherry Goodman, are here with us today. Uh, Sherry uh, coming and having uh, uh, connections right to uh, my district in Cape Cod. I look forward to their testimony and that of Mr. Weisenfeld and Mr. Worthington. I'll soon introduce them, but we'll first yield to our ranking member, Mr. McCall of Texas, for an, any opening remarks that he might have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last year, I was briefed by the head of Earth Sciences at NASA to discuss this important issue. Uh, and the national security assessments are clear. Climate change poses risk to the security of the United States and the international community. The best way to address climate change, however, is less clear. President Obama's approach was to set unrealistic greenhouse gas reduction targets within the framework of the Paris Agreement that would have cost our economy a fortune, hurting working people living paycheck to paycheck. When President Trump announced his intention to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, he also expressed a, an openness to re-entering or renegotiating the deal on terms more favorable to the United States. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about their recommendations for a way forward that appropriately balances the very real need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the United States and around the globe especially in China, the world's number one emitter. With the need for economic growth and a reliable, affordable supply of energy, I come from one of the top energy producing states and the largest oil and gas producing nation in the world. Our abundant natural resources, including fossil fuels, which produce 80% of the world's energy, not only support our economy, and good paying jobs, but they make us more secure as a nation. Mr. Chairman, the uh, committee is not in order. Ranking member is correct. Committee members will uh, withhold their conversations to the ante room if they could have them. Uh, chair recognizes the ranking member. I thank uh, the chairman for that. We are fortunate that we do not depend on an energy supplier like Russia that uses its dominance in European gas markets to coerce and intimidate its neighbors. We are no longer at the mercy of the OPEC cartel for the majority of our oil needs. Instead, thanks to innovation and technology, we become a net energy exporter that offers our partners and allies a stable, reliable supply of energy resources. We have also been able to hold down prices for consumers, which contributes to domestic and global economic growth and prosperity. Many energy companies are taking great steps to shift to cleaner sources to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is taking place not necessarily because of government policy, uh, but despite it. From 2005 to 2017, U U.S. greenhouse gas emissions declined by 
In 2017, U.S. greenhouse gas emissions were the lowest since 1992. China and India accounted for nearly half of the increase in global carbon emissions in 2017, and developing country emissions will continue to rise to the point that all of the United States and Europe's emissions will soon be far surpassed by other economies. I've witnessed firsthand the devastation brought to families in my state and district from flooding and extreme weather events like Hurricane Harvey. The recovery efforts are ongoing and the impact will last well into the future. As the world's largest economy and preeminent power, the United States has a responsibility to help lead global, global efforts to address climate change based on realistic solutions as opposed to extreme unrealistic unreal, goals based on aspiration alone. With that, I look forward to the testimony of the witnesses and on how we can achieve uh, that goal. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, thanks, Ranking Member. Uh, now I have the opportunity to give a brief introduction to our witnesses uh, who we are grateful for their presence here today. Thank you very much for taking the time to come. Vice Admiral Dennis McGuinn served as Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Energy, Installations and Environment from September 2013 until January 2017. Prior to that, he served on active duty in the United States Navy for 35 years as a Naval aviator, aviator test pilot, aircraft carrier commanding officer, and national security strategist. As Vice Admiral, he was Deputy Chief of Naval Operations and Commander of the United States Third Fleet. Admiral, thank you for being here and thank you for your service. Sherry Goodman is a senior strategist at the Center for Climate and Security, a member of its advisory board and chair of the board of the Council on Strategic Risks. She's also a senior fellow with the Wilson Center. Prior to this, she was CEO and president of the Ocean Leadership Consortium and Senior Vice President, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary of CNA. From 1993 to 2001, Ms. Goodman served as Deputy Undersecretary of Defense and Environmental Security, the Chief Environmental Safety and Occupational Health Officer for the Department of Defense. Ms. Goodman, thank you for being here. Paul Weisenfeld, Weisenfeld I apologize, is Executive Vice President for International Development at RTI International, uh, an independent nonprofit research institute. He leads RTI's international development practice, which designs and implements programs across a wide range of sectors to help lower and middle income countries and communities address complex problems and improve the lives of their citizens. He earlier served as foreign officer at USAID, leading high profi profile initiatives across various international development sectors. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, I know that uh, the chairman will be pleased. Uh, uh, you have met him in the past, and, and I th I'm sure he'll mention that. Last but not least, Barry Worthington is an executive director of the United States Energy Association, U.S. member committee of the World Energy Council, and an advisory organization that represents 150 members across the American energy sector. He represents the broad interests of our country's energy industry working to develop energy infrastructure projects around the world. He chairs the Clean Energy Production Working Group within the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe Committee on Sustainable Energy. Uh, welcome again to all of you. Thank you for your time and expertise, and I'll now recognize you for five minutes each to summarize your testimony. Let's start with Admiral McGinn. Mr. Keating, Ranking Member McCall, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the critical impact of climate change on our national security. My views are based on over 35 years of military service to our nation in the United States Navy. As a former Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Energy Installations and Environment, and presently as a senior executive intimately familiar with the issues of energy, the economy, and our environment. As we start the conversation today, I want to note that there are many ways that climate change threatens U.S. national security that are not the primary focus of this hearing. Those are the direct impacts on military bases and military readiness, from recurring flooding at Norfolk Naval Shipyard to the impacts of record rainfall and flooding at Camp Lejeune, to the evacuation of Naval Air Station Point Magoo 
last fall as the Hill Fire approached the base. Climate change is already impacting our military installation readiness right here at home and will to an even greater extent in the future. Today, however, our focus is on global threats and how changes in the climate will drive instability and increasingly create adverse geopolitical outcomes around the world. To set the stage, it's helpful to view some of these threats the way our senior military leaders do. First, they see more sources of conflict to which our forces may have to respond. The conflict may involve internal strife due to mismanagement of increasingly <clears throat> limited natural resources or economic displacement. Or it may be conflict between states competing for limited water or food resources. We are increasingly seeing the prospect of conflict driven by control of rivers and the possibility of one nation trying to limit water to another. Second, they see climate-driven unemployment, displacement, migration, and despair creating a pool of prospective recruits for violent extremist organizations. When a young generation has few prospects and seemingly nothing left to lose, terrorist organizations claim to offer them a way out. Third, our senior military leaders see the prospect for increased tensions in the Arctic. As the ice melts, as trade routes open up, and as more resources become accessible, we see both Russia and China moving to exert military and economic control over the high north. Fourth, our military leaders see a greatly increased and more frequent need to respond to humanitarian crises and natural disasters, especially in the Pacific and the Caribbean. These storms are devastating. They are deadly, and they leave behind wreckage that can take years and, in some cases, generations to recover. So clearly, the first step in combating the national security impacts of climate change are to recognize that we are already dealing with them. The next crucial step is to understand the serious implications for our future national security environment. We cannot now, nor as future challenges bear down on us, treat any of this as a surprise. We have a responsibility, therefore, to prepare for the changes we see coming, to lead and help shape the global environment to protect American interests and our national security. Current and future generations of our, of our service members, and indeed all Americans, deserve our very best efforts. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit a, a more detailed statement for the record. Any objection? Thank you. You may submit that. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Goodman. The oh, microphone. Thank you, Mr. Keating, Mr. McCall, distinguished members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for holding this important hearing. My views are shaped by my 30 years of experience as a national security professional. Uh, at the outset, I would like to acknowledge that while climate change discussions have been polarized, there has been one major exception, and that is security. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dunford, Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, General Scaparotti, former Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, and many other senior leaders of the Department of Defense have been clear-eyed about this issue and the threat multiplier effect on our national security. The intelligence community has identified climate change as a security risk in every worldwide threat assessment for more than a decade, including the three years of this administration. Congress has passed multiple important provisions in the last two defense authorization bills, including a declaration that climate change poses a direct threat to the national security of the United States. Both were signed into law. I want to thank the members of this committee for their bipartisan support for these measures. Recently, myself, Admiral McGinn, and 56 other senior military, national security, and intelligence leaders who served across Republican and Democratic administrations sent a letter to the President affirming the consensus view in the national security community that climate change is a threat to U.S. national security. 
Building on this consensus, I would recommend the committee adopt a pragmatic view of the security threat that climate change poses and respond in a way commensurate to that threat. We need to acknowledge that the newly navigable Arctic Ocean is emboldening our adversaries. As the ice melts, Russia and China are increasingly moving to exert control and influence over the region. For example, Russia is building up its military presence in the north and is seeking to monetize the northern sea route by proposing a toll road for military escort through shallow waters close to the Russian coastline. We should incorporate the impacts of increasing water scarcity as a result of climate change and other factors into our risk calculations for international conflict, especially as nations may increasingly be compelled to use water resources as leverage. For example, in the most recent escalation of tensions between India and Pakistan, India used the diversion of rivers as a threat. China holds similar leverage over India with Indus's river origin in China. China may also respond to climate stresses by asserting itself more aggressively over shared resources in its region, such as fish stocks in the South China Sea that are moving northward as the sea warms. Further, China sees an opportunity for strategic benefit vis-a-vis -vis the United States by investing in the climate resilience of countries in the Asia-Pacific region and beyond. We should take note and not let China outmaneuver us. Climate stresses across Africa and the Middle East are in also increasing economic and food insecurity, driving migration and forced displacement making it easier for violent extremist organizations to recruit members and increase the likelihood of conflict. The good news, however, is that despite these unprecedented threats, we have unprecedented foresight capabilities. Technological advancements and more sophisticated predictive tools in both the physical and social sciences, in the research and development capacities inherent in our many, many national security and civilian agencies, mean we can see more of these threats coming with a greater degree of reliability than ever before. The bottom line is that we have a responsibility to look at climate change and its impacts pragmatically in terms of America's national interests. We have a responsibility to account for the current and future climate change stresses in our security calculations, our planning, our foreign policy, and our investments overseas. And we have a responsibility to prepare for the changes that we can see coming. That responsibility includes advancing a robust agenda for addressing security implications of climate change by reducing the scale and scope, investing in resilience, both energy and infrastructure, adapting to those effects that are already locked in, and supporting our partners and allies through American leadership in climate security. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask that my written statement be submitted for the record. Thank you, Ms. Goodman. You were there right to the second. Unbelievable. Uh, Mr. Weisenfeld. Mr. Keating, Ranking Member McCall, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for calling this hearing on such an important and timely topic. I've submitted my full written testimony for the record and will summarize it in my remarks this morning. Throughout my career in development at USAID and at RTI International, I have been honored to work on U.S. supported programs related to agriculture, the environment, global health, democracy and governance, and more. The topic of today's hearing brings to mind two important truths that I have learned during my career. First, development affects U.S. national security, and second, climate change affects development. Put simply, American national security interests benefit when countries are stable, secure, and able to meet the basic needs of their citizens. This is why development along with defense and diplomacy, is one of the three Ds of U.S. national security. The best chance we have to promote resilience is to support development geared towards strengthening systems to withstand climate-related pressures. As USAID Administrator Green has said, the ultimate purpose of foreign assistance is to end its need to exist. Climate variability exacerbates the challenges facing developing countries and complicates local government's capacity to enable food and water security. Rising temperatures not only threaten crops, livestock, and water supplies, but also allow for the spread of diseases by expanding the habitable range of mosquitoes and parasites. 
The United States has been a leader in responding to these trends and promoting resilience in developing countries. For example, the U.S. government's Feed the Future initiative, on which I had the privilege to work, has seen incredible success. This effort has helped more than 5 million families avoid hunger and helped farmers generate $10 billion in new agricultural sales. I want to thank this committee for its steadfast support for this initiative. I've had the opportunity to speak with smallholder farmers and their families in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. When they talk about what most worries them, many say climate change. For these farmers and their families, and by extension their communities and countries, these changes can mean the difference between a life of dignity or one of desperation. Many organizations funded by the U.S. government are working across the globe employing innovative and successful practices and technologies to promote resilience in the face of climate-related pressures. Introducing these innovations in impoverished areas helps farmers and herders adapt, and it can prevent communities from backsliding into hunger and conflict. Let me give a few examples. As part of a USAID-funded program in the Philippines, our team developed water resource maps for the conflict-prone island of Mindanao. The program revealed that the region's top agricultural exports, all of which are water-intensive, were being planted in water-stressed areas. We provided suggestions for improving water management, thus protecting livelihoods in the face of climate-related risks. In Somalia, RTI funded by USAID implemented an innovative camel leasing model in response to recent droughts, helping herders protect their livestock and their incomes from climate-related threats. In southern Senegal, a Feed the Future project implemented by RTI is working to strengthen food systems for staple crops. This project installs solar-powered rain gauges, allowing insurers to accurately determine when farmers may be at risk of failed production. Equipped with this tool, smallholder farmers are more likely to invest in quality inputs that yield more and produce better quality products demanded by buyers. Organizations like mine are also stepping up. Through an internal investment, RTI is working in Rwanda to develop a model using drones and artificial intelligence to identify with greater precision which crops will grow and when, such as whether maize will grow in a certain region by 2030. When the United States invests in development, we're investing in security. When we partner with countries to strengthen food security, better manage natural resources, eliminate diseases, or strengthen democratic practices, we are helping them take ownership of building a stable and more secure future. To conclude, there is no doubt that drought, famine, or a disease outbreak will again threaten vulnerable populations in fragile countries. But this is not a losing battle. The United States has a record to be proud of. We have effective approaches that promote stability in developing countries in the face of climate change and other threats. This cannot be done without the United States Congress's continued support. I want to thank you again for your leadership and commitment on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Weisenfeld. Uh, Mr. Worthington. Thank you, Mr. Keating. Uh, good morning, Ranking Member McCall and other members of the Committee on Foreign Affairs. Um, the U.S. Energy Association helps expand energy infrastructure in developing countries with the U.S. Agency for International Development, and we also contribute to policy and technical discussions with the U.S. Department of Energy to expand the use of clean energy technology around the world. Through our membership, we represent over 100 uh, companies and associations across the U.S. energy sector, from the largest Fortune 500 companies to single-person consulting companies and everything in between. Our membership is both energy production and energy efficiency companies, but also engineering, finance, legal, research, and, and consulting organizations. Our objective is to convey information about the realities of global energy issues in the 21st century. Uh, we are an educational organization both by function and by tax status. And again, thank you for inviting me to appear before you today. Um, the risk of climate change is real, and industrial activity all around the world is impacting climate. Addressing climate change is a challenge for our country. It affects every citizen in the world. Uh, while our industry addresses the, cli the changing climate, it continues to ensure that American citizens have access to increasingly safe, 
affordable, reliable, and clean energy. We have more than a, a billion global citizens, a billion global citizens with no access to energy and another billion plus with inadequate access. Women in developing countries spend all day foraging for sticks and animal dung to generate energy for cooking, lighting, and heating. This is very dangerous. Burning firewood and animal dung indoors kills children. It causes asthma and all kinds of other health problems. Access to energy provides improved health, education, and economic development. Consider considering a global population growth of another 2 billion people by mid-century, it leaves our energy industry globally to provide for 4 billion more energy consumers by 2050. Our industry's challenge is to double the provision of energy services globally while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Many of these new energy consumers all around the world will utilize fossil fuels because they are domestically available, they're abundant, and they're affordable. We should all work harder towards helping them use high efficiency, low emission technology. USCA members have volunteered for over 25 years in 50 countries to do this. Lack of adequate energy poses national security concerns for all countries. Domestically, our industry has undertaken a wide range of initiatives to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We're very proud of our progress. Electric power carbon dioxide emissions have declined 28 percent since 2005. 28 percent. We expect this trend to continue. Methane emissions from natural gas have declined over 18 percent, even though we've increased natural gas production by over 50 percent in that same time period. We've invested over $120 billion in uh, our greenhouse gas emissions reducing technologies. The solution to the dual challenges of climate change and global access to safe, reliable, affordable, and clean energy is technology. And an all of the above approach is necessary. Americans lead the world in innovation, and we can complete the energy revolution that began in earnest a decade ago. In the United States, increased U.S. domestic energy production has actually resulted in uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions. And we can continue to do this without additional regulation. We do not need the Clean Power Plan. We do not need the Paris Accord. We'd rather pay the engineers and technicians to reduce emissions than to pay the lawyers to prove that we are in compliance with the needless regulation. My uh, written testimony cited the Chamber of Commerce's numbers on uh, what the cost of complying with the Paris Accord would be. Other countries are today expanding their consumption of fossil fuels. Coal mines are being built in Russia and China and dozens of other countries. They're going to release greenhouse gas emissions for the next 50 to 60 years. If we implement the Paris Accord, our economic competitors will access cheap energy while we force American consumers and industry to utilize high price energy. I pose the question, do, do our competitors having access to cheap energy? while we're paying more, is that a threat to our national security? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'd th like to thank all the witnesses. I'll now recognize members for five minutes each to ask questions, starting with myself. All time yielded is only for the purpose of questioning the witnesses. I agree that there will be many new consumers, but uh, I also know there will be many new industries to come out of the green and renewable energy sources where it would be great for the U.S. to have a competitive advantage in these new industries as others are no longer as cost competitive. But I'd like to uh, gear in on just the, the threats of specific countries, perhaps, uh, with this important security issue. Uh, climate change has been categorized as a threat multiplier, which makes existing security risks even worse. Can you comment on how climate change impacts the challenges posed by Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea specifically? Any witness that? Admiral McGrain. Uh, it's a great ex expression, Mr. Chairman, to uh, say that uh, the effects of climate change act as a threat multiplier for instability. 
If you look especially around the world between the tropics, uh, you will find many fragile societies, many fragile governments that pushed a little bit further by the effects of uh, natural disasters or food uh, shortages, water shortages, uh, flooding, uh, any of the, the, the disasters that we're seeing increasingly uh, and more frequent uh, will cause them to fail. <clears throat> and into that failed uh, state or society will rush all manner of, of, of uh, bad people and, uh, and bad effects. So uh, ultimately, we f see our young men and women in uniform now and in the future increasingly having to respond to those to protect the national security of the United States and, and our allies. So in all of the countries that uh, you mentioned, there are uh, aspects of this that are uh, they're dealing with internally, but importantly, at, on the international stage, Russia and, uh, and China will fill any gap in leadership that the United States leaves as it relates to climate uh, climate change mitigation and uh, climate change adaptation. So in uh, fragile countries, fragile societies where China is making investment in uh, increasing their resilience, uh, that is something that the United States is losing. That's also uh, been echoed by Secretary Hagel, Secretary Mattis, and uh, do any of the witnesses have any comments? Uh, Ms. Goodman. Uh, Mr. Keating and members of the committee, I think the clearest example is the Arctic. Uh, today we have a whole new ocean that has become navigable uh, because of sea ice retreating, permafrost collapsing, temperatures rising. Uh, Russia uh, is in militarizing its portion of the Arctic in order to prepare for a future uh, where it can control routes across the Arctic, uh, as I mentioned, as a, as a toll road and an economic highway to economic and security advantage. China declared itself in 2018 to be a near-Arctic stakeholder um, and has global ambitions in the region. It's declared that it's the sea routes uh, across the Arctic are shorter than the current routes controlled by the United States through the states, Straits of Hormuz and the Straits of Malacca, um, and it will see advantage as, as those routes become increasingly navigable in the future. Um, so I think this is a, a very clear example of uh, an area where we've seen increased geostrategic competition. Just quickly, uh, you know, 40 percent of the world's population uh, lives within 100 miles of our coasts. And that affects so many other issues as well. So uh, I know, Ms. Goodman, you, you've spoken to this, but could you speak to how climate change and ocean acidification could disrupt food stocks uh, like fish stocks and fish migration and what these risks would be imposed to coastal communities and the implication it might have not on, on just food supply but on our national security? Yes, ab absolutely. Um, we're seeing changes in um, fish stock uh, migration moving northward, areas that were once very abundant becoming overfished, areas subject now to ocean acidification being less bountiful, but other areas further north and south in the poles uh, becoming more abundant. That puts many of the uh, communities uh, into high intense urban areas in the um, mid-latitudes at great risk, both in, across Asia and Africa. Uh, combined with extreme weather events from increased hurricanes, cyclones, and typhoons put many of these populations in increasing fragile circumstances. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll now yield to the ranking member for questions. Mr. McCall. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. As I mentioned in my opening statement, I, I met with uh, NASA scientists on this issue. They said we're not uh, policymakers, but we do want to show you what the data is reflecting. Um, and I think, as Ms. Goodman, you point out that Africa where I'm particularly concerned about uh, extremism, uh, will continue to get drier uh, and lack of um, water. Uh, having said that, I want to focus on what's realistic, sensible, achievable, and pragmatic here. Um, President Obama pledged to cut greenhouse gases by 26 to 28 percent by 2025. Um, Mr. Worthington, to your knowledge, was the private sector, including energy industry, consulted prior to this? 
to my knowledge, there was no consultation with the energy industry. And do you know if the administration released a cost uh, benefit analysis or any sort of economic analysis to justify the numbers? I've not seen any uh, economic analysis uh, relative to this issue that was done by the previous administration, sir. Do you know how many countries uh, legislatures ratified this agreement? Uh, many did, not, not all, but many did. Um, by far enough for the Paris Agreement to go into effect. And I guess that's why we're having this discussion here is because this, this Congress did not. Um, your organization did support President Trump's pledge to renegotiate the terms of the Paris Agreement. Other than just uh, withdrawing or adjusting President Obama's uh, terms, what terms of the agreement itself do you think could realistically and in an achievable uh, sense be renegotiated? Well, I think the biggest concern that we have as an industry is the notion that we don't have a level playing field with our economic competitors. Um, our commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 28% has been met by the electric power sector uh, in the United States. We've done that already. Uh, the entire energy industry hasn't, and other parts of the economy that contribute to uh, climate change, agriculture, steel, cement, and so forth, haven't made the gains that we've made in, in electric power. But, you know, um, the Chinese commitment in the Paris Accord was basically that they would try. There was no percentage reduction insisted for China. They would, they would try. That was the best that they would commit to. So in urging that the uh, accord be renegotiated, we, we would like to see a level playing field where different countries around the world all had a, 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 an opportunity to do the same type of emissions reduction that the United States was committed to. I think, and I think that's a good point. I mean, to, uh, Admiral McGinn, Ms. Goodman, I, it's always good as the, you know, it, it's a piece of paper signed, but it's always good as the enforcement mechanisms. Uh, to Mr. Worthington's point, China is continuing to fire up a coal plant every week. And I would argue is one of the ma biggest uh, emitters of greenhouse gas. Um, Mr. McCall, uh, that uh, fact, factoid of one power plant, coal-fired power plant a week is, is uh, old news. In fact, China has become one of the leaders, uh, leading uh, producers and exporters of green technology around the world. They did it for a variety of reasons. Uh, it could be argued whether or not uh, Paris was a factor there. But if you look at some of the uh, major cities in China, in choking levels of air pollution, water pollution, land pollution, they see the imperative, and they are living in many cases with uh, the effects of climate change, and they recognize that they had to do something about it. And oh, by the way, that it wasn't a zero-sum game. It wasn't, well, we can deal with climate change or we can have a strong economy. It's an and proposition, and the United States can do that as well. The creation of jobs over the last 10 years, if you compare and not in, a, in an us versus them, but if you compare the number of jobs created in green industries from energy efficiency to solar to wind, every aspect of it is uh, multiple times more than the job creation in a uh, fossil fuel industry. My time's running out. I know they have invested quite a bit in photovoltaic technology and, and solar. And Ms. Goodman, do you have any uh, comment? Uh, thank you, Mr. McCall. I, I would argue that combating the climate challenge uh, is not only about American leadership in the advanced energy transition, which is indeed extremely important, but it's also about American leadership on climate resilience, predictive analytics, and a whole range of advanced technologies that will enable us to have resilient economies for the future. Energy is a piece of it, but there's quite a bit more in the built environment. And as you've heard, I think also from scientists um, in, at NASA. That's a very good point. I'll, let me close with, uh, <clears throat> I had this discussion with uh, Senator Lindsey Graham the other week, and he was talking about a Manhattan Project for clean energy. I think that's something that, as we look 
than being productive here instead of sparring in a partisan way. If we're trying to find solutions, uh, I think we should be looking at ideas like that as well. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Um, let me uh, get right to the questions. Repeated national security strategies adopted during the Obama and Bush administrations listed, listed climate change as a key threat facing the United States. But on December 18, 2017, President Trump unveiled a national security strategy which omitted climate change as a threat. So let me ask Ms. Goodman and then Admiral McGinn, what are the consequences of striking climate change from our national security doc documents? Why don't we start with uh, Ms. Goodman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the consequence is that it makes it more difficult uh, for our national security professionals and our military leaders openly to address the risk today, though many have spoken about it directly. And it also makes it more challenging uh, for American climate leadership to measure up to the other global leadership we believe is so important. Um, it, this is a fundamental security challenge of our era, um, and only by being present and exerting our leadership will we be able to recognize and address those threats in a commensurate manner. Thank you. Admiral, Admiral McGinn, based on your time in uniform, how do, you think the mil how do you think the military as an institution sees climate change? I, I believe they uh, see it, I know they see it as a, as a tremendous challenge and a growing challenge, Mr. Chairman. Um, and ultimately, people in uniform are pragmatists. You can't uh, debate whether the intelligence about a minefield uh, at sea or shore or whatever uh, is supported by 75% of the intelligence or 90% or 10%. Or you act on what you know and what your best judgment tells you. And in our military, especially among our most senior military leaders who are on record talking about climate change as a significant growing national security challenge, they are saying we need to do something about it. We are doing something about it. And I think all the support that they can possibly get to do those things from the Congress is absolutely essential. Thank you. Uh, according to media reports, uh, Cyclone Edai in Mozambique left nearly two million people in need of assistance. UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez, with whom we met, called it an uncommonly fierce and prolonged storm, and yet another alarm bell about the dangers of climate change. Mr. Weisenfeld, how do increasing humanitarian emergencies caused by climate change affect how we provide development assistance? How are we changing how we provide development to make communities more resilient? Thank you very much, Chairman, for the question. I Could you push your, um, uh, maybe move it closer? Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. for the question. I think the recent events in Mozambique highlight the impact of extreme weather events and climate change on communities and countries that are countries with limited resources to deal with these kinds of challenges and countries that sometimes are often prone to conflict. And we've seen devastating results in, in the cyclone in Mozambique, as you've said, that have spilled over into neighboring countries, into Zimbabwe, for instance, where I had the pleasure to serve. I think it's in throughout my career, I've seen that where there are crises like the cyclone in Mozambique, um, where there are crises like the earthquake in Haiti, the American people are extraordinarily generous and want to reach out and support vulnerable communities and respond to suffering. Um, and that's something that I know will continue, but it's always much better, much more cost effective to get ahead of these problems. And my, my fellow panelist, Ms. Goodman, has talked about the predictive analytic capabilities that are available these days and kind of having a better understanding of what is likely to happen and what kinds of preventive measures in terms of better construction in terms of understanding how to manage water flow better to limit the kinds of impacts that we're seeing around the world is something that requires strong investment, it requires sustained investment and important U.S. leadership. And I think we do have the tools and we have um, the ability to get ahead of some of these problems in a much more cost-effective way. And I think foreign assistance has shown that it's, it's good value for money in providing preventative care as opposed to the large, expensive responses that are necessitated by those kinds of humanitarian tragedies. Thank you. China is leading a global shift toward renewable energy, and for the third year in a row, 
China has ranked first in EY's Renewable Energy Attractiveness Ratings. It invested $126 billion in 2018, which is three times that of the United States. It plans to invest another $360 billion by 2020 and an estimated $6 trillion by 2030. China is not only increasing domestic renewable investments, but also extending investments into foreign countries, helping stimulate the global economy and spreading its global influence. And we see this all over the world, but it's particularly troubling to see what China is doing vis-a-vis -vis what we're doing. So let me again uh, ask Ms. Goodman and also <coughs> Admiral McGinn, can you elaborate on the response China has had to climate change? Admiral, why don't we start with you? In uh, developing countries um, in Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, China is uh, there on the ground in many of them, obviously for their own strategic uh, geopolitical purposes, but they are making investments in um, industries that uh, relate to uh, clean energy. Uh, they are making investments that increase the resilience of those, uh, those countries. And as was noted uh, just a moment ago, uh, a tremendous amount of uh, the population of the Earth live cl very close to uh, the oceans. And that makes them subject to uh, sea level rise, but importantly, it makes, in the near term, it makes them subject to uh, tidal surges, typhoons or hurricanes, and anything that, uh, that can be done by a global leader like China, like the United States, that increases the resilience is a, uh, an investment in the future. Thank you, Ms. Goodman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, China is on a global quest for resources to feed and power its domestic economy, but also to expand its global influence. We see this across Africa, throughout Asia, in South America. We see this with increasing uh, extraction of energy and mineral resources, uh, fish stocks, but also increasing foreign direct investment um, in countries across from the Arctic to Africa and Asia that provide not only resources back home, but leverage uh, into economies of other countries about which, uh, for which American leadership needs to be present to counter that influence. Thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony. Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wiesenfeld, uh, in your testimony, you referenced neglected tropical diseases, or NTDs, and you have focused on the need to have a holistic approach to development. Along with my colleagues, Congresswoman Karen Bass and Congressman Greg Meeks of New York, I've introduced a bill, H.R. 826, that it seeks to address NTDs. So I'm particularly grateful for your and RTI's commitment to fight NTDs, and respectfully would ask that the chairman, our good friend, uh, 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 Elliot Engel, uh, looked to mark this bill up at ASAP. It has passed in this committee in the past, uh, but then uh, ran into some snags uh, along the way. But my hope is that we take another shot at it this year, and soon uh, it could make a huge difference. But I would like to ask with regards to this particular hearing, with respect to global health, can you describe how climate change affects diseases of poverty, such as NTDs, especially in fragile states, and secondly, how do intestinal worms, in particular, heighten susceptibility to co-infection, particularly among food insecure or malnourished people? Thank you very much for that question, Congressman. And thank you for mentioning the Neglected Tropical Disease Program, the NTD program. RTI is extraordinarily proud of, having, of being one of the organizations helping to implement the programs to eliminate neglected tropical diseases worldwide. And we're very grateful for your leadership and the committee's leadership in supporting those efforts. As people may know, neglected tropical diseases are diseases that blind and disfigure and disable people around the world. And the programs that this committee has supported have protected over a billion people worldwide from those diseases. They're also a great example of how strong US leadership and focused programming could have a tremendous impact in moving countries towards resilience and self-reliance, as USAID Administrator Green says. Because the neglected tropical disease programs are programs that have actually eliminated diseases as a public health threat from many countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And those are the kinds of successes that you don't easily see every day. 
in development. So again, we're, we're, we thank the committee for its leadership and we're proud to be a part of it. Regarding your question, I think one of the worries that we see around the world is as you see increased temperatures and extreme weather events, we're seeing the spread of diseases, particularly around increased temperatures. Rising temperatures allow for the expansion of diseases because they expand the range of insect vectors of disease, the range for mosquitoes, the range for parasites. So you're seeing increased vectors for malaria, for chikungunya, for dengue diseases that are in some cases fatal, diseases that can really harm individuals. They affect the livelihoods of communities and families. They have a, a negative impact on overall economies. Um, these diseases also affect not only humans, but plants and animals. So they affect the larger food supply as well. Regarding your question on worms, one of the series of neglected tropical diseases, soil transmitted helminths, um, we see an increase in that when people's immune systems are compromised. And in situations like the floods in Mozambique we've seen, where, or famines in the countries that are suffering from famine in the last couple of years, we've seen famine risks in Nigeria and South Sudan and Yemen and Somalia where people don't have enough to eat, where they don't have enough to drink, where you see increased risk of cholera, it compromises the immune system and makes people much more susceptible to the potential for co-infections. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. You know, I was the House sponsor of the, of the uh, Global Food Security Act, passed the House three times. It did become law, and uh, Betty McCollum was our chief uh, co-sponsor, did a wonderful bipartisan effort on that. Uh, but I've always been concerned that we not feed the worms uh, you know, since there are 1.4 billion people walking around with parasites and worms, it seems to me that, that we need to do more on that, and our bill would certainly take us in that direction. But thank you for showing the correlation, if you will, uh, between the two. Um, uh, very little time left, but there's a great deal of support <clears throat> in this committee and in the Congress, for, uh, bipartisan support for Power Africa. And I'm wondering um, how well that is playing into, I mean, what are we doing to exacerbate or to, is it neutral when it comes to uh, concerns about climate change? Uh, how would you respond to that? Maybe Admiral, you want it or, or someone else. I think uh, we can do more. We are doing a lot, uh, basically um, driven by global terrorism, if you will, in, which finds some of its uh, origins in, uh, in North Africa in, in particular. But I think that we can do more in terms of working with the militaries and the national security uh, organizations of those countries and showing them ways that they can become more resilient, more resilient to food shortages or water shortages or uh, sea level rise or tidal surges. And that is an, a, a gift that lasts for literally generations and change, changes people's lives. Clearly, we're going to be there when uh, there's a major humanitarian disaster. But being able to make those countries more resilient has a lasting effect. And our whole national security uh, apparatus, not just the military, but organizations like uh, USAID can play a tremendous role in increasing the, uh, the resilience of those countries. You know, we're out of time, but uh, perhaps later on or for the record, you can provide it because I'm talking about the electrical grid especially to make sure that we are doing the right thing in terms of build out. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Sherman. Thank you. We focused a lot on the physical effects of uh, global warming and climate change, but there's also the, rep the uh, reputational risk that we face being the one country that doesn't even pretend to be doing our share to try to stop it, at least not at the national level. Uh, our hearing today is on national security. We can learn from the past. In World War I and World War II, the winner was not necessarily the strongest country, but rather the strongest alliance. For 70 years, the United States has been the unquestioned leader of the most powerful alliance or network of alliances the world has ever seen. Um, now we've renounced uh, uh, the Paris climate change talks. We've announced that we won't do our agreed share. What effect does that have on our overall ability to hold together uh, these alliances? Admiral? I think it's a question, uh, Mr. Chairman, of uh, leadership and leadership by example. We are judged by what we do, not just by what we say. And we need to um, continue
to be that global force for good that you pointed out uh, has existed for over 70 years since uh, the devastation of World War II. And as you also pointed out, it isn't just any one country or any one nation. It is an alliance of nations that uh, come, come together around uh, economic uh, and, uh, and democratic political values that uh, are going to prevail against this newest challenge, this global existential challenge of climate change. And I'd point out our allies are democracies. So just having a few leaders at the top saying, well, we understand, uh, does not measure the effect that this has long term on populations that will be there long after this or that leader uh, um, uh, leaves. Uh, Ms. Goodman, do you have any comment on how this uh, affects our ability to keep uh, the alliances that have undermined, uh, that have uh, uh, girded our uh, uh, national uh, security? Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Uh, I would observe that this week we are observing the 70th anniversary of the NATO alliance, uh, which has been foundational to American security uh, during that period. I grew up in, during the Cold War and spent my early years working on NATO matters and nuclear security as the fundamental security challenges of our era. Uh, I believe that climate change poses an equally fundamental security challenge today and that American leadership in conjunction with our allies and partners is as fundamental to this challenge as it has been uh, within NATO and to fighting the challenge that we Thank you. I want to move on to one other issue and that is uh, China. Um, they are subsidizing the export of panels, but they subsidize any uh, manufactured good that they think is uh, uh, going to be relevant to the future, and they do that for their own economic interest, sometimes driving down uh, industries in places like the United States. Uh, when it comes to climate change, they seem to be much less interested than in smog and particulate matter. And of course, climate change, the effect of whatever you do is worldwide. They seem to focus on uh, the very severe problems that they have uh, breathing the air in their own cities. Now, China emits twice as much greenhouse gases as the United States. Of course, they have four times the population. Uh, they uh, announced uh, with pageantry that uh, they're going to keep increasing their greenhouse gases right up until 2033 to 2030, and then we'll see what happens after that. Other than reaffirm our own commitments in Paris, what can we do to get China to do uh, uh, more? Uh, I believe we've decreased our greenhouse gas emissions. They're increasing theirs. Uh, 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 Mr. Westfield, do you have, uh, or which on the panel has a response? Looks like the Admiral I has a response. I believe that uh, we can uh, compete so much more competitive. We, we can be so much more competitive in this energy transition from uh, primary dependence on fossil fuel, which, oh by the way, has been very, very good to the United States uh, for, for over 100 years. But now is the time to change, and the opportunity to change uh, exists in our great technology and our universities and our business models. There's tremendous amount of capital that is waiting to be invested in this uh, energy transition, and I think that that is one of the best ways that we can influence uh, the behavior of, of China, by us producing ways in which they can maintain their quality of life, their economic growth, and in fact, everybody can, but doing it with uh, good technology and business models. I'll point out that I look forward to the day when there are more than a couple of uh, vehicle recharging stations in the Rayburn uh, garage, and I uh, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for being here. Mr. Weisenfeld, just curious, uh, talking about natural disasters with some component uh, of climate change in the mix there. Are you familiar with the, the numbers over the last decade of deaths per 100,000 based on natural disasters? Is it going up generally or going down? 
I am. Um, I'm not familiar with that data at okay. the moment, but I can look into it and get back to the Congress. I'm a little familiar, and so I just want to, because all this stuff's important to us as policymakers, trying to get the policies right. But the, but it's gone down dramatically, dramatically per hundred thousand over the last uh, over the last hundred years. And and just in case you're interested or the audience is interested, most of the deaths occur uh, from earthquake as opposed to flood or drought or hurricane or something like that. So when we talk about getting this policy right, all that stuff has to be considered. We don't want to just assume that natural disasters are occurring uh, as a component of climate change and causing more deaths than they have in the past because that, in fact, is not the case. Um, Mr. Worthington, the United States, as you know, has a vast amount of traditional resources and under this uh, under this president uh, an energy dominance strategy uh, associated with that and i just want to get your thoughts on the world bank's uh, notable finding that uh, that china uh, enjoys energy or dominance in the in the arena of metal and rare earth metals in particular which are required in many cases to supply the technologies for a carbon restrained or constrained future from a national security standpoint, I mean, are we, are we playing right into China's hands by, by eschewing what we have in our country, literally hundreds of years of resources at our, at, at our availability and into uh, an economy based on what they have essentially been dominated, dominating and continue to seek to be dominant in? Thank you for that question, sir. There's, there's evidence that exists that would suggest that we have traded our reliance on Mideast oil to a reliance on rare earth elements from China. And that's a, there's, there's plenty of evidence that that's actually what's happened and is, is continuing to happen. Um, we do have abundant domestic resources. By increasing our domestic fossil energy production, that has actually allowed us to reduce our CO2 emissions in the United States. And the notion that we should become dependent on China or any other country for that matter on rare earth elements um, is, is just a road that we should not be going down. But nevertheless, that's, that's the road that we're going down right now. So as a general, if, if we recognize that and, and generally agree, what is the solution set for America? Is the solution set include uh, more involvement in, 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 in rare earth mineral um, rights and uh, industries, or is it, is it uh, reliance more on what we currently have in our country, or is it a combination of the two? What should our strategy be vis-a-vis -vis our probably greatest geopolitical uh, adversary? Well, like so many other aspects of the economy, diversity is a key strength. And we, we need to develop rare earth elements here in the United States. Uh, there are uh, abundant supplies of rare earths in uh, coal, for example, uh, and that can be byproducts of mining coal. We also need to work with other countries that have resources uh, that are other than China uh, to help them develop their rare earth element resources as well. Is this something that we've constrained ourselves to, or is there something that, that stops us from developing the rare earth industry in, in the United States and abroad on behalf of the United States? I don't think it was a deliberate policy decision. I think we kind of blundered down this path um, because by, you know China uh, is cheap. And, and so we, instead of developing our own resources, we, we kind of got seduced into uh, a set of circumstances where we're buying on the cheap, and that means buying from China. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you for holding this hearing. I'm most impressed by the witnesses. I really want to thank Ms. Goodman and the Admiral for signing on to the letter to the President on this topic. I share your concerns. I think he is moving us absolutely in the wrong direction, not only by pulling out of the Paris uh, Climate Accords, but by not recognizing climate change in the national security strategy. 
We've heard a lot this morning about how climate change is a threat multiplier, and it's been mostly in relation to China and Russia. But I'd like to talk about those fragile states and how they become vulnerable to terrorist recruitment. Uh, we've seen a lot of evidence uh, uh, and I would ask you to comment on some of this, where areas that are, uh, their life, people's lives are upset by lack of water, lack of food, just general instability, people are ripe for recruitment. We've seen this in Iraq with ISIS. We've seen it in the Lake Chad area with Boko Haram. Uh, we've seen it across the Sahel and Mali. Uh, Islamic groups there have used that instability to provide resources and to encourage people to join their side because they can uh, address these issues. Would you say that that is accurate? Do you have, have you seen other examples of this? And do we consider the impact of climate change enough as we try to develop a strategy to deal with terrorist recruitment around the world? I'd ask the Admiral and Ms. Goodman to start with that. Well, as you know, th around the world, there are many, many divisions along it, that have been there for centuries in, in some cases, economic divisions, cultural, religious, political. And what the effects of climate change do is it puts a, a magnifying glass over some of those divisions so that when you have a, a societal crisis like f food shortage or water shortage or a major uh, natural disaster, uh, that just exacerbates the, uh, the situation and causes those divisions to escalate uh, to the point of, uh, of armed conflict in many cases, which can spread to even regional conflict. So recognizing that uh, this pressure on fragile societies and fragile governments will cause many of them to fail. Are there some things that we can do to increase their resilience that, so that they're not as dependent on one uh, aspect of coastal farming, for example, in Bangladesh? Or that if, not if, but when the next typhoon strikes, there's going to be an ability to evacuate people to higher ground so that you uh, can avoid the kind of mass migration uh, towards India that could cause uh, a major regional problem. So there are, I would say the word that we need to focus on, how can we help nations help themselves to become more resilient and recognize that uh, if they're only one drought away or one flood away from a major immigration crisis, uh, we need to figure out how can we prevent that from happening or how can we mitigate its effects. Ms. Goodman, would you talk about uh, terrorist recruitment? Yes, violent extremist organizations like Boko Haram, and ISIS, and others are essentially weaponizing water and food, holding vulnerable populations at risk as hostages in circumstances to their own advantage. Uh, and that's exacerbated by, because of the increasing drought uh, that is displacing people, uh, in some of these regions across the Sahel and parts of the Middle East. Uh, as a result, they, they can thrive on the ins additional insecurities created uh, within communities when regions in, in, for example, the Lake Chad region, which has shrunk so much over the last decades, can no longer support the fishing, the farming, and the herding populations because of um, the decline in available water and other resources in the region. So it, um, this is happening. There are opportunities, I think, through our own, uh, uh, through Power Africa, Feed the Future, our work with allies and partners uh, across the region to make these communities more resilient and be and able to withstand some of these shocks and effects. Re related to that, as you brought up, uh, Admiral, you know, environmental changes cause ecological changes, cause demographic changes, and that often comes through migration, and you see that with the Rohingya. And uh, it seems to me this just feeds into these problems. One of the most dramatic examples, and it's uh, a, a present generation uh, geopolitical challenge, is what happened and is happening in Syria. You can trace the roots of that back to all of those cultural, economic, political, religious divides that I mentioned before. But 
when you have a long-term drought, as Syria experienced uh, over the past uh, five to 10 years, that caused um, uh, migration to cities because the ability to live on the land that they had previously been living on for decades, in some cases uh, centuries, was taken away, and it just put that magnifying glass on all of those, div those divisions, and it exploded into civil war. And uh, I'm not trying to make the case that climate change is a direct cause, but it certainly is a significant indirect cause for the kind of strife that we deal with uh, the tremendous consequences of, including uh, cross-border migration, terrorism, uh, all of those violent uh, organizations that Ms. Goodman mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Titus. M Mr. Yoho. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you back. I uh, appreciate the panelists here. And, um, you know, a discussion on climate change and national security, I think it's something that we need to have, but I think it's something we need to keep in perspective. If we look at all things that are affecting America or our security, where would you rank climate change when you rank it with debt, China, cybersecurity, the theft of intellectual property? As Mr. Worthington pointed out, 100% of our rare earth metals were dependent on China. 90% directly come from China, the other 10% come from countries that get it from China. And you know, we can go on the polarization of politics. So where does climate change fit in there? Where, where would you rank it? It's right near the top. I'm not trying to make a case that it is the most uh, compelling, but in terms of the broadness and the depth of its uh, implications for us today and going forward, it is a very, very serious challenge for our nation economically, environmentally, and in terms of energy. In terms of the uh, rare earth uh, dependence, we've got an ability in this country with the kind of university and businesses that we have, the technologies that we are developing, to make rare earth elements less of a, a challenge by developing other means of, st of storing energy, et cetera. I'm going to so, cut you off there because yeah. I agree with you. And we've got a, a bill that we're putting in, the rare earth and critical minerals bill, that we have a national stockpile two to three or three to five years out there that we can readily access. I'm not saying we have to extract it right now, but we need to know where it is and we'll go after it when we need it for national security reasons. Uh, I'm going to ask the panel here, because Ms. Goodman, you brought up, you stated that climate change has led to the mass migration. Is that correct? Climate change is a factor in the mi in okay. the vast migration flows that we see. How many people, do you have any estimate of how many people have been displaced by climate change out of the 70 million from the Middle East, Asia Pacific region? What percent would you say climate change related? Uh, I think the way, the way to think about it, Congressman, is that the factors we've discussed of extreme weather events, sea level rise, temperature rise, uh, increased drought and water scarcity are exacerbating the reasons that people move. All right. When I look at the uh, water map of Africa, there's plenty of groundwater there. What we see so often, uh, it's the inability of governments to respond or governments cause the problem. And as you pointed out, Boko Haram and these other terrorist organizations will use anything they can to leverage people. Mm -hmm. And they do that when we give U.S. aid relief, uh, whether it's food, what, whatever it is, they hold that. And we see what's going on in Venezuela. That's not a climate change condition. That is right. bad politics. Exactly. And so to say that, you know, um, you know I, I hear that we're not leading. I agree with Chairman McCall stating that, you know, we pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord, and I'm glad President Trump had the leadership to do that because it was a piece of paper that bound this nation, whereas other nations like China or India say, well, we'll try. You know, and that's at the expense of the American population. And if you look at from 2005 to 2017, U.S. economy grew by 20 percent, while our energy uh, consumption fell by 2 percent. Energy-related energy CO2 emissions also decreased during that time period from 05 to 2017. It dropped 14 percent. That's leadership. If the rest of the world will follow what we do, instead of us going after the, the you know, and the politics that gets played over climate change, um, I think is, is damaging this country. Um, I think we need to look at it. We need to look at all energy sources. You know, uh, Chair, uh, Mr. Keating stated out that, you know, we pulled out of the Paris climate change and this was terrible, yet in Cape Cod, where I, I assume you're up in that area too in Massachusetts, they can't get the Cape Cod wind farm because it says year-round and summer residents express concerns over the location of the project. 
Some claim that the project will ruin scenic views from people's private property as well as the view of the uh, public property and that it would interfere with yachting. So if they're really serious about this, build the dang so, uh, wind farms and don't, you know, don't say not in my backyard. Um, so I think we should look at it strategically. I think the warming of the Arctic is very serious because China is wanting to lay claim in there because they say, well, we're near territory. Those are the things that I see, and it's not following the international norms that we need to stand up against China and back them off now. If not, they're going to have bases up there. They're going to be extracting energy, and they're going to, I mean, you look at what they did in the South China Sea and tore up 4,000 acres of coral rock. Mm -hmm. That's got to be bad for the climate, too, but nobody says a word to China. I'm out of time, and I'm sorry I didn't get that as much of a question. I'm just angry. See you. Thank you, Mr. Yoho. Ms. Spanberger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much to our witnesses for being here today. Um, Ms. Goodman, I'd like to ask a quick question just for some level setting for people here on this committee hearing. Related to the Paris Accord, it is my understanding that the Paris Accord did not bind our actions, the actions of the United States. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Each country sets its own nationally determined commitments. So to confirm, we, the United States of America, submitted the goals that we thought were appropriate for us and the goals that we wanted to, um, to achieve into the future. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. So to draw upon that a little bit further, my question is, how much benefit is the U.S. receiving from the continued dedication of our European allies and U.N. members, uh, states who still are committed to the Paris Accords uh, and their climate change actions? And then separately, what risks are we taking um, in your assessment by not being party to these agreements any longer? Well, I, I think the risks that we're taking um are the continued license for China, Russia, and other um, great powers of this age to uh, meddle further in, with not in our own American interests and with our allies and partners. We see that particularly across Euro Europe today. Uh, we see the increasing leverage of both Chinese foreign direct investment, Russian energy um, leverage across Europe, and without a strong American presence and American leadership, uh, both within the NATO alliance on climate leadership, uh, we put our own security at risk. Thank you. And would any of the other witnesses want to add anything to that question? I would just say uh, the phrase leadership by example. Uh, the United States has been a force for good and continues to be. And anything that we do that uh, undermines our own credibility by not acting in a way that uh, a global leader needs to act to be that continuing force for good is uh, detrimental. Thank you very much. Mr. Worthington? Uh, yes, let me just say that there's not a single European country who's on track to meet their commitments under the Paris Accord. So uh, given no. that they're not on track to meet their commitments, do you assess that that's a reason to abandon commitments and, and efforts to achieve them? Uh, no, that's not what I said. Uh, I did mention in, in my testimony that our energy industry, particularly electric power, has achieved a 28% reduction in CO2 emissions. There's only one other country in the world that can claim that. Um, emissions in Germany are going up. Uh, the use of coal-fired power in Germany is increasing, not decreasing. So then, what in your assessment, sir, would be the, the fact that our European allies remain committed to the Paris Accord, um, what benefit do then do we receive because of their continued commitment? Their continued commitment uh, of talking is not reaching their their commitments. They are they are not delivering on what they're talking about. They they publicly, verbally, and in writing will make commitments to reduce emissions. 
the reality is they're not reducing emissions, they're increasing emissions. Would any of the other witnesses care to comment on that? Thank you, Ms. Goodman. Uh, I think the right analogy here is, is uh, within the NATO alliance for 70 years, we have uh, that alliance has enabled Europe and America to be whole and free and to spread the values and, and norms uh, in, in a globally constructive and productive manner for our economies uh, and our peoples. We have ver at various times um, uh, taken our European allies to account for not fully meeting their financial commitments within the alliance. Um, that's a continuing burden sharing discussion. It doesn't mean we don't value the alliance uh, and the commitment and the leadership. And I would say here, we're going to have within the climate community, there's going to continue to be debates about the right levels of commitment and who's living up to their individually nationally determined commitments. Those are reasonable to have at any given time. It doesn't, um, it, it doesn't obviate the need for the overall commitment uh, to address the climate challenge. Thank you. And in some of the discussions here today when talking about the national security threats to global climate change and the fact that when there is a vacuum um, in times of extreme weather events, we will see that vacuum filled by someone, if not uh, good positive actors such as the United States or aid agencies. I think the same is relevant uh, to what you were saying, Ms. Goodman, that um, in the absence of U.S. leadership, someone else will be stepping in, and I think that is to our f future detriment. Thank you. For your testimony, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Bamberger. Mr. Zeldin. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, continuing the conversation on the, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, if, Mr. Worthington, if the uh, United States was to remain in the Paris Agreement past 2020, uh, can you speak to what role the executive branch uh, should play in consulting with the private sector and Congress on responsible greenhouse gas reduction targets and should it publicly produce its economic analysis and cost-benefit conclusions? I think that's correct. I think that we have not been part of the discussions during the last administration as to what we should try to do relative to climate. As I mentioned, uh, we have re received or achieved remarkable reductions in greenhouse gas emissions in the energy industry. We were, we were not doing that because of the Paris Accord. We were doing it for a whole variety of other, uh, of other reasons, including our, our customers, our employees, our shareholders. Um, everyone wants us to reduce emissions, so, so we're reducing emissions. Um, uh, if the Paris Accord were to be re renegotiated, we would very much like as an industry to have a seat at the table to discuss how that might be best achieved. Thank you to all the witnesses for, for being here. Does, uh, do, do any of you believe that uh, President Obama should not have submitted it to the Senate for ratification? Do, do any of the witnesses disagree with the statement that President Obama should have submitted it to the Senate for ratification? Military, not political. Anybody else want to win? Okay. Um, yeah, China is the world's largest greenhouse gas em em emitter. Uh, what were China's commitments under the Paris Agreement? Uh, and can you speak to Beijing, whether or not they're living up to their commitments? The, the uh, Chinese commitment was to try. That they would, they would basically try to reduce emissions. There was no commitment any further than that. And I'll add that, you know, recognize that today uh, China is building over half of the coal plants that are under construction in the world today, about half of them within China and about half in other countries. And part of the reason for that, we've, we've heard discussion where if the U.S. steps back from a leadership role, someone else will step in. Well, the United States stepped back from a leadership role in terms of helping developing countries develop their fossil energy resources. The World Bank stepped back largely at the urging of the prior U.S. administration, and as a consequence of that, all through Africa and parts of Asia, 
You see the uh, Chinese companies building coal-fired power plants only to the standard that they believe is relevant, which means essentially no standard at all. If we had exerted U.S. leadership, instead of allowing that vacuum to occur, we could be seeing these facilities being built, but built to standards that are modern, that are responsible environmentally, and responsible in a, in a climate context. Instead, we step back and allow that, that vacuum to be filled by the Chinese. One of the, uh, the debates that we'll have in Congress on this topic and out of Congress is a regulatory approach versus a market-based approach. Uh, if any of the, uh, the witnesses can speak to uh, the role of technology and innovation in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I, I serve as a director on uh, the Electric Power Research Institute and uh, the membership of, uh, of EPRI is primarily utilities of all sorts, rural electric co-ops to investor-owned to public utilities. And the private sector is significantly engaged in uh, trying to uh, produce ever cleaner, more reliable uh, electricity and to apply that electricity in places like transportation, for example, and, and uh, commercial and industrial activities where we haven't had the technology to be able to do that. So the, in my experience, the private sector, uh, for in many cases, because of their customers or their workforce, the motivation to uh, not just have safe, reliable, affordable, but also clean uh, re uh, electricity delivered is really, really driving the industry in a very, very positive direction. And I think that a lot of the uh, greenhouse gas reductions that were cited earlier came about as a result of efforts uh, in the, uh, in the uh, utility business. Some of them were self-motivated. Many of them were because of regulation and policy that produced a positive effect. So it, it's a matter of achieving that, that, uh, that good balance. Thank you for your service, Admiral. I'm out of time, so I'll yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. I will now recognize the uh, gentleman from Florida, uh, Mr. Ted Deutsch. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the uh, really terrific panel for being here. Uh, thanks for your service to our nation. Uh, we're on the brink, as we've been discussing here this morning, of major global catastrophes caused by climate change. Sea levels are rising, threatening coastal communities. Warmer bodies of water are feeding stronger storms like Hurricane Michael that intensified rapidly into one of the strongest storms in our history. Droughts are affecting crop production. Shorter winters will displace wildlife and impact cold weather tourism. Uh, you said earlier, everyone began, you talked about Camp Lejeune and Norfolk, but these troubling signs are also impacting my community in South Florida. Rising sea levels threaten the Coast Guard facility at Port Everglades. In Miami, the rate of rising sea levels is outpacing the global rate by nearly tenfold in Miami Beach. The resiliency projects already underway uh, cost over $500 million to raise roads and improve drainage systems, but worsening flooding during the annual king tides, the highest tides of the year, is threatening now even inland communities. Unfortunately, this administration has shown little interest uh, or willingness to take any action. Uh, I founded the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus in Congress to serve as the first forum for rank and file Democrats and Republicans to sit together to discuss how these events will devastate our nation. Last Congress, we had 88 members split evenly between the two parties. The size of the caucus and the regional diversity of the members reflects the growing recognition of climate change's effects in regions all across the country. I particularly would like to recognize my Republican colleagues on this committee, Representative Rooney, the co-chair of the Climate Solutions Caucus in this Congress, and Representatives Fitzpatrick, Kinzinger, Mast, and Zeldin for serving on the caucus. We hope that this Congress, the caucus, will play a more active role in actually getting things done. Caucus recognizes that climate change isn't just a threat to the U.S., but a threat to the world. Prolonged drought, food shortages, bigger and more devastating storms, the spread of diseases can undermine stability, as we've heard this morning. Uh, the world needs to prepare for refugees fleeing home countries that will no longer be habitable due to the impacts of climate change. We watched as Cyclone Idai devastated southeastern Africa, flooding hundreds of square miles, damaging Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Malawi. Thousands could be dead, and cholera cases now ha exceed 1,000. And a drought in 2018 almost caused Cape Town, South Africa, to literally run out of water. 
In the absence of administration action, Congress must step up to act. Americans of all political stripes acknowledge climate change and expect their government to do something, something that will actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions, something that will seriously address climate change. And I hope that this Congress, we will do that. Um, Admiral McGinn, uh, the DOD and intelligence officials have explained how climate change forces our military to adjust strategy and policy. Um, what there have been references that a number of you have made to Russia and China. I, I'd like to, I'd like to just spend a minute addressing whether China and Russia face these same challenges. You've you've spoken about the opportunities to them, particularly on the Arctic Circle. Uh, but how is climate change affecting our military's uh, security interests? Uh, China and, and Russia both face internal challenges of climate change. It's, as you know, it's a global, a, a global phenomenon, a global threat. Uh, our military uh, is being called upon more frequently because of the uh, natural disasters uh, that are caused by, by uh, Mother Nature. Uh, but I think that uh, our ability to operate out of our bases here in the United States as well as overseas is increasingly going to be impacted. You uh, mentioned Hurricane Michael and what happened to uh, Tyndall Air Force Base. Uh, Hurricane Florence uh, coming up the uh, eastern seaboard and the uh, devastation it wrought on Camp Lejeune. Prior year hurricanes at, uh, in, in uh, South Carolina at Paris Island, uh, and the list goes on. So I think that uh, our investment in resilience and recognizing that our military needs these platforms to launch American power downrange and to be able to be effective in all of their missions is absolutely necessary for investment. Thanks. Ms. Goodman, actually, let me, let me ask you about um, something that, that we've talked about in this committee before. The research that environmental stressors didn't cause the Arab, Arab uprising of 2011, but the impacts of climate change may have served to increase the likelihood of instability. Can you elaborate and provide an example of how climate change has undermined stability in the Middle East? Well, in Syria, in the years preceding the deadly conflict there, there was prolonged drought, and that drought drove farmers and herders that had lived peaceably in the rural areas uh, to abandon some of those rural areas and move, migrate towards cities. That created civil unrest as the, uh, as the cities were unable to accommodate, and that enabled extremist forces to move in. Uh, so the drought is directly connected uh, to the onset of the civil unrest and the increasing violence. It's not the only factor, but it's an exacerbating factor. And if I might add in response to the last question, that climate change is degrading military readiness uh, in the United States today as we see our bases and stations increasingly at risk from extreme weather events with costs over $5 billion now to reset both Tyndall uh, and Camp Lejeune and also the floods recently across the, the Midwest affecting uh, Stratcom and, and Omaha and not to mention the regular sunny day flooding that occurs in Norfolk as well as in your, uh, in your region, um, in Miami. This is a, a very significant effect on our military. We, we, we thank, thank you for you your response, much. and the gentleman's time has expired, and the chair will now recognize uh, Susan Wild, the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, for thank five you. minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm one of those people that believes that the American military is uniquely qualified and capable of working on real climate solutions. Um, and I'd just first like to know whether all of you agree with me on that or disagree. Agree. I, I guess, and I'm seeing nodding of the head. So. Uh, what I would really like to see is some sort of directive to our military operations that climate change is something that we need the military to proactively work on and to assist the rest of the world in coming to solutions. And I understand to some extent that's happening. Ms. Goodman, could you, could you tell us something about what initiatives the U.S. military is engaging in now or planning to undertake in the future to combat climate change? Okay, th thank you, thank you, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, let's, 
I start from the assumption that the, the military's mission is to provide the most effective and capable fighting force uh, in the world and for the United States. And so the things that the military can and should do in addressing the climate challenge is in support of that military mission. Um, and so, for example, when I observe that extreme weather events are causing damage to military bases, we need to be at the forefront of learning how to reset our base infrastructure to be resilient to those climate effects. And that's part of the military mission. That will have other benefits to the local communities in which the bases are located, from Norfolk um, to Florida. At the same time, the military is a large user of energy in the United States. And what we've learned over the last several decades is that we can increase the performance and effectiveness of our, of our propulsion systems, of, our, uh, of much of, the, of our weapon systems, and at the same time, we can be more efficient in our use of energy and we can take advantage of changes and technology advances in, in the advanced energy system. So we've seen that, for example, when in Iraq and Afghanistan we were losing uh, people, putting, putting soldiers at risk when they were convoying fuel to the front, we learned how more efficiently to provide that fuel and water to our forces at the front, whether it was by providing different ways of, of, of powering our bases with more fuel efficient um, insulating foam and other techniques, or by being more efficient in the provision of fuel or water. Those all support the military mission that technology development done through a variety of different research and development programs, both in the Department of Defense and in conjunction with the Department of Energy and others, provides valuable benefits for the military mission. And at, at some times, just as it's done through other techno non-military technologies, has aided in the development commercialization of those technologies. So I, I, I'd like to see us be more proactive and a little less reactive to, to all kinds of problems in our country and in our world and, and in the context of this hearing, particularly climate change. Um, do you believe, um, Ms. Goodman, that this administration, actually let me ask this of Admiral McGinn, if I may. Um, Admiral, do you believe this administration is taking climate change and the threats that it presents to U.S. national security and global conflicts as seriously as it should be? Uh, I think the rhetoric is, is, uh, would appear that, uh, that it is not, although there are many, many people in the administration, I'm absolutely certain, understand the business case for doing something about uh, this, this enormous problem. Uh, there are costs, there are benefits, and there are risks to any endeavor in the, in the military sphere, in the national security sphere, and these prag pragmatic people, these patriots, get that, and they are taking appropriate actions, but those actions could be so much better supported and accelerated and magnified, and the effects so, so much better, the benefits so much sooner and broader, I think that uh, that could be a major change. And I'll just say, I am so pleased as a citizen to uh, hear both sides of the aisle talking about climate change is real. It's a problem. Lots of uh, discussions about how best to deal with it and, and all of that. But recognizing a problem is 50% of its solution. Thank you. I'm almost out of time here, but how might it be better supported? You mentioned that it could be better supported in this endeavor. I think encouraging uh, the, the deployment of uh, better forms of energy, microgrids, uh, storage systems, working with uh, the private sector and public-private ventures, working with communities as the Navy has up in uh, New London, Connecticut, out in uh, Hawaii and in, in California. And I just think that uh, that could really, really accelerate the deployment of clean energy to the economic the benefit general. of our private sector and our overall economy. Thank you. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. We're going to go to the next member. Uh, we're going to go for the gentleman from Ohio. Mr. Chabot, you're next, sir. Thank Bye. you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I spent the last almost two hours in Judiciary Committee dealing with H.R. 5. Just got here. So uh, rather than ask questions that probably some of my colleagues already asked and were answered, I'd like to yield my time to the gentleman from Florida, uh, Mr. Yoho. Thank you, Mr. Chabot. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And again, thank you, guys. 
You know, and I, I've heard over and over again some things that I really like is it's the adaptability that we have to do. You know, we can argue the causes and all that, and we can get into that, and it becomes political. But it's the adaptation of our military bases. I've come from Florida, and so we're well aware of the effects from that. We've had Hurricane Irma go through the whole state. And, you know, leadership. We've seen a record amounts of coal-fired power plants go out, of, go out of business with this administration, switching to either going out of business or switching to LNG. And I guess, Mr. Worthington, since you're from the energy um, um, realm, is that a good thing, switching to LNG from coal? Well, it's a good thing when individual companies, corporations, make decisions that are in their best interest based on the market. Uh, at the current moment, you have uh, our abundant, wonderful bonanza of shale gas development has provided uh, the United States with a very unique opportunity. Uh, we are expanding our domestic energy production uh, while we're reducing CO2 emissions. Okay. It's, it's really quite marvelous. And we've run an energy summit in the last two years. Uh, Jacksonville, I'm sure you're aware, aware of this, is the largest storage bunker in capacity in the United States of LNG. And we've had 20 different nations that have come there. They want LNG out of the U.S. And, you know, from a geopolitical standpoint, they want something that's inexpensive, reliable, with a reliable partner. And so our goal is to do this. And yet we talk about China and, the, you know, the different accords that countries sign up to, and we heard that the EU is not adhering to it. Um, China is trying, uh, yet they're building these dirty coal power fireplaces and, or um, power plants instead of using the new technology. And I think it just shows the disingenuous of China, and I th think it shows the leadership of America by um, putting in the regulations to allow us to export more LNG having countries convert to LNG. Turkey was there, and they get about 98 percent of their energy from uh, outside sources. And Mongolia gets 90 percent of their energy from Russia. And Russia uses that as a geopolitical tool. So as far as climate change, um, I, I'll ask the panel, what can we do to get countries to stop building the dirty coal plants, you know, like China's doing without the advanced technology? Admiral, how do you put pressure on a country like China? I think uh, competing uh, economically and providing the kinds of solution you mentioned, LNG, that as a, as a, a good uh, interim substitute for coal. Uh, you get uh, electrons out, but you don't get, uh, you get half of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions that you would for a coal plant, uh, to say nothing of the other, other emissions. I think that uh, if we continue to invest in our technology, not just uh, advanced technology, but actually deploying things that work, better storage technology, uh, better uh, production of, uh, of wind and, and solar electricity, uh, better electrification of our transportation system, we can, in fact, uh, motivate uh, nations like Russia or especially China to, uh, to invest in those things as well, even more, and to deploy them. Uh, and I'd like to see Made in the USA on uh, more and more green things across the world. Oh, I sure would too. And, you know, and I, I look at energy, it's all of the above. We want the ones that make the most sense that, you know, benefit everybody and that's profitable. Um, this committee and the president signed into law last year the BUILD Act, which is something to counter the China's BRI initiative. And this is something as we go to the developing countries that we can use that technology or that, that vehicle and invest in the proper technology that will uh, propel them into the 21st century in a smart way. Um, I'm going to yield back to Mr. Chabot if you have any other comments, and thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. We go to the next member, this uh, member from California, uh, Ted Liu, Mr. Ted Liu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Five minutes. I previously served on active duty and I know that we have the best military in the world because we rely on data, on facts, and on science. Uh, we don't live in a fantasy world because if we did, U.S. troops will die. We live in reality and we understand, the military does, that climate change is real and it's harming national security. That's why I'm so pleased that Republican Ranking Member McCall today in his opening statement acknowledged that climate change is real 
and it's threatening U.S. national security. Uh, we can't solve a problem if people don't agree that there's a problem in the first place. So I'm pleased that more and more Republicans no longer believe climate change is a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese. Now, uh, Admiral again, you had stated that in your own testimony earlier to your question, that climate change ranks right near the top in terms of threats to U.S. national security. I believe you're right. Uh, there is an article in The Guardian titled, Pentagon Report Finds that Climate Change Threatens Half of U.S. Bases Worldwide. One of these bases is Joint Operating Base in the small island of Diego Garcia. Can you explain to us how important that base is to U.S. national security and our ability to project power? It is uh, located in a very strategic area of the world in which, uh, you, from, from which you can use it as a platform to uh, send uh, power downrange to the, the Middle East, to the, uh, the, the South Asian uh, subcontinent, and uh, to, uh, to lose that, that base's effectiveness at, uh, at Diego Garcia because of sea level rise or other reasons would cause us to slow down the ability to flow in combat power, logistics, and all the things you need to respond to a, a regional crisis or even a humanitarian assistance crisis. Thank you. And in fact, in the first uh, Iraq war, airstrikes were launched from that base, correct? That's right. All right. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to enter uh, that article in for the record. I'll catch him later. I'll... Mr. Chair, I'd like to enter the article in for the record. Without objection? All right. I have a second article now. How Climate Change is Threatening the Navy's Footprint in the Pacific. And it talks about the island of Guam, uh, where I served on active duty. And the article says, this tiny Western Pacific island is central U.S. security interests in the region. It is home to two of the nation's most strategically important military bases, both threatened by climate change. Uh, can you uh, explain to uh, the committee how important uh, the two bases on Guam are to our national security? Once again, it is uh, because of location uh, to areas of potential conflict or actual uh, unrest now that, uh, that Guam and those far, uh, far Western Pacific uh, platforms, in this case the U.S. territory, are. Uh, we've got capabilities there for missile defense of forward. Uh, we've got capabilities to uh, launch uh, uh, and, and to maintain a submarine presence, uh, surface warfare, and of course with uh, with the uh, Anderson Air Force Base, uh, any kind of uh, uh, Navy, Air Force, or Marine Corps uh, air power. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, I'd like to enter that article into the record as well. And then my final article okay. today, uh, the military paid for a study on sea level rise. The results were scary. It's a Washington Post article dated April 25th, 2018. It talks about uh, this small island of Roy Namur, which houses the massive Ronald Reagan ballistic missile defense test site. It is now a routine threat of flooding because of climate change. Uh, can Emergen or Ms. Goodman, can you explain how important it is uh, to have the Ronald Reagan ballistic missile test site not flood? Yes, that, that's very important, Congressman. That's a, a space radar tracking station that was um, uh, de put, constructed for that island of Kwajalein. Um, at a cost of approximately a billion dollars and could be at risk of being overrun uh, or losing its fresh, uh, losing its water sources or having uh, coastal erosion uh, degrade that capability within the next decade or so. Thank you. Uh, in my home state of California, we went from the eighth largest economy in the world to the fifth largest economy in the world, even though we had the strongest climate change laws in the nation. And it's clear when you look at the data that when California did what it did, all these people want to work on clean energy, clean technology, solar, wind, all decided to come to California. So I've introduced legislation, uh, the Climate Solutions Act, that basically takes California's laws and makes it national because we want the best and brightest in the world when they want to work on green technology and move our country forward to not go to China or Germany. We want them to come to the United States. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the next member to speak is the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, um, Member Houlihan, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate all of the time of the panel. 
I, uh, similar to Rep. Blue, uh, I served in the military as well, and I did my field training at Tyndall Air Force Base. So it's uh, kind of a catastrophe to think about that base in its current state versus the way that it was when I served. Uh, and like many of my colleagues, I will probably follow Representative Liu and Representative Spanberger's lines of questioning. I'm really concerned that we've left the Paris Accord uh, for lots of different reasons, but one of them, uh, Admiral, has to do with one of your statements, which is that we have to lead by example, and we are no longer doing that, and we're abdicating our leadership role. Uh, and so one of my questions to you, Admiral, first is that you mentioned in your testimony, both live and in written form, administration officials that have stated the need for the government to address climate change. And my question to you is, how can Congress, how can we help support the findings of the military and the intelligence communities in their efforts to mitigate climate change, even though the White House currently seems unwilling to recognize this growing threat? So what can Congress do to be helpful? I, I think continuing the discussion as a, as a, a first a step, a, a necessary step in a bipartisan way that this is a real problem. It is growing. Uh, delay of uh, implementing uh, solutions to both increase our resilience as well as to mitigate uh, the, uh, the uh, greenhouse gases that we're putting out there, uh, it only gets more and more expensive and more risky as, as each uh, year goes by. And I think that uh, encouraging uh, every uh, department and agency uh, in the administration to uh, do things that make sense from a business perspective, that uh, the business case for uh, creating win-wins, a win for the economy, a win for the private sector, a win for the mission of whatever that department or agency is, especially the Department of Defense, uh, just makes so much sense. And I think there's uh, so many incentives. There are uh, obviously investments. It, it, it takes uh, money to an extent, but it also takes guidance as well uh, for us to uh, assume, assume and maintain that mantle of leadership. And I agree. I, I spent a lot of my time before doing uh, coming to Congress in corporate social responsibility. I think it's only in the best interest of many businesses to do the right thing for the planet. Um, and actually, I would like to present the same question uh, to Mr. Worthington that I just presented to the Admiral, which is in your testimony, you said, we can do this without additional regulation. Uh, we don't need the Clean Power Plan. We don't need the Paris Accord to achieve continued progress. Uh, we'd rather pay engineers than lawyers. And so my question to you is, is there nothing that Congress can be doing to be helpful to advance things like climate change, which you also agree is real? I think that the most important thing that we need as a, as a country that only Congress can do is to put additional resources into research and development. Um, we have uh, made great strides in deploying renewables. We've made great strides in improving the efficiencies of fossil units. Um, we have a need to resurrect the domestic nuclear industry with small modular reactors. Uh, there's a whole variety of technologies that are just sitting on the cusp. We have a great opportunity to increase our uptake of renewables if we can get less expensive um, electricity storage in place. We have a great opportunity uh, uh, eventually to convert some of our energy consumption to hydrogen-based fuels. Um, we have a great opportunity to reduce emissions further uh, by deploying carbon capture and storage on fossil energy units, um, both coal and natural gas. Um, all of this is critical, um, I, I but we need additional technology development, R&D, and that's where Congress can, can be very helpful. And we 100 percent agree on that. That is something that we definitely need to move forward on and support. And with the last few seconds of my time, um, I'd like to ask Ms. Goodman, uh, Representative Liu talked about some places that he had served uh, in, in Guam and some places uh, specific to, to his service. My question has to do with something in Pennsylvania. We have a DLA depot in Susquehanna, Pennsylvania that has identified that they are in fact being affected by climate change. Uh, they maintain $13 billion in materiel. Uh, what, kinds of things for the, what kinds of things will happen uh, if that particular uh, area is affected as it, as it anticipates being by climate change in terms of the downstream effects of uh, the supply chain, if you can comment on that. Uh, well, it, it will uh, affect, it will degrade the 
DLA's ability to perform its mission at that location if it's increasingly subject to either extreme weather events or uh, sea level rise or coastal erosion in that, in that Susquehanna area. It does provide, that is an important location for DLA. I, I know that and um, you know that, that mission, so they need to make those facilities resilient so they can continue to operate. That's a combination of working both in the built and the natural uh, infrastructure and then working solutions in uh, conjunction with the surrounding community and using available technology like predictive analytics mm. Uh, and other solutions that will enable us better to understand and anticipate those threats, basically prepare in advance uh, to address those challenges. Thank you so much to everyone for your time, and I yield back. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, very much. Mr. Watkins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the witnesses for being here. My question is for Ms. Goodman. In your testimony, you noted that China published its first public Arctic policy in 2018, wherein it declared itself a near Arctic state and articulated its intention to build a polar silk road. Could you elaborate on this? Uh, yes, Congressman. Um, in 2018, China did release its first Arctic policy. It's been expanding its capabilities to operate through the, throughout the Arctic, um, declaring itself a near Arctic stakeholder. Uh, looking to increase, shorten its shipping times uh, from China into Europe by transiting across the northern sea route, um, increasing its uh, ice-capable vessels uh, and ability to operate in the Arctic, uh, increasing its extent of research and development across the region, um, and also increasing its foreign direct investment uh, with other Arctic nations, in particular Greenland and Iceland. Thank you. This question is for anybody who'd like to address it. There are many countries around the world, of course, that are extremely underdeveloped. Um, I've spent a large part of my adult life working in a few of these countries. Uh, does limiting the use of certain energy resources around the world make it harder for these underdeveloped countries to grow their economies? and to play a, a role in their, in their regions or in the world? I, I would say um, any country that is developing and wants to uh, increase their quality of life and economic viability uh, needs uh, the best form of energy that suits their location and their needs. Probably the most dramatic example I can think happens in uh, sub-Saharan Africa where there have been companies and there have been private organizations that have brought solar power that has enabled cellular communication, satellite communication, access to the internet, and has empowered those communities to uh, do things like uh, extract uh, water from uh, solar powered wells that have uh, been able to uh, transform their, uh, their local economy at a very, very low cost without having to build a central power plant and a, and a transmission distribution network as we did. This is similar in many ways to what happened after the Cold War when Eastern Europe did not have to create telephone poles and wires to have a modern telecommunication. They were able to go wireless because the technology was available and it was affordable and it was able to be deployed very rapidly. I think that same way of going about things is, uh, is true for these Leap, developing Leapfrogging companies. technology. Leapfrog, yeah. leapfrog exactly, mm -hmm. trying to maximize the benefits and minimize the costs, uh, the, the economic costs and the environmental costs to deploying uh, energy to uh, developing countries. Great. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, that's it, Mr. Chairman. I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my friend, Mr. Espiat, has been waiting, and I'm willing to yield to Mr. Espiat and then take my turn after that. Thank you, Mr. Count. This is the, the greatest form of collegiality I've ever seen while I've been in Congress. It must be that wonderful <laughs> colored tie he's wearing today. Um, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, climate change is an existential threat, and just want to start this by uh, laying out this fact, and uh, if we don't act, it will have massive harm of our children, our future, and our children's uh, children. And we are already seeing the effects uh, today, increased heat, uh, 
frequency and intensity of natural disasters and lack of water, the effects of climate change can be seen around the world and often it affects uh, the already marginalized among us. It makes worse political conflicts and endangers all of us. Uh, having said that, and being a member of the uh, Western, Hem Western Hemisphere uh, Subcommittee, I want to uh, ask a couple of questions. Uh, well, the first one is, uh, first of all, I'll start out by saying that academic institutions such as Stanford, Columbia University, partner often with activists, not-for-profits, and venture capital firms to essentially reverse engineer solutions for communities suffering from devastating impact of climate change, including, as you've seen uh, in the Caribbean and Latin America, uh, there's been a, a, a currently a, a, a horrible drought that's crippling uh, the agriculture of many of those countries. We've seen the patterns of hurricanes and tropical storms devastating the Caribbean as well. Uh, from my understanding, in a short amount of time, these initiatives have yield substantive insights, uh, these partnerships with uh, academics, uh, not-for-profits, and people on the ground. So I want to ask Mr. Weisenfeld, can you discuss the USAID investment in similar partnerships with academia or the private sector which seek to drive uh, innovative solutions to build resiliencies and mitigate the effects of climate change? Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Congressman, for that question. I'd be happy to discuss that. I think as you've described, the impacts of extreme weather events, increasing temperatures have dramatically negative consequences for communities, for often forcing communities into situations of suffering, floods, droughts. We've seen increased diseases for plants in Central America. We've seen increase in coffee rust. Um, USAID, under the Feed the Future initiative, the U.S. government's Global Food Security Initiative, has invested in research and innovation and new technologies through a range of universities that they call innovation labs. And we've seen that employing new technologies, new ways to improve water management, um, more drought resistant crops, more efficient me methods at utilizing fertilizer <coughs> can be preventative ways to build resilience in those communities and help them avoid the kinds of dramatic consequences that we see. And what about the Caribbean? We saw what happened in Puerto Rico, uh Harvest, horrible storm, Puerto Rico is still reeling back from the impact of those storms. Uh, there's no guarantee uh, that that region uh, will not be unfortunately hit again by uh, either a hurricane or what they call baguadas. That's, uh, you know, you have maybe 12, 14 days of rain, torrential tropical rain. How could the Caribbean prepare us, begin to prepare itself uh, for this uh, reality that is going to impact the lives of people there and, and our own lives here, uh, given that we have a large populations of folks from those nations. Uh, are there any best practices or uh, ideas of what the roadmap should be short term and long term for uh, the Caribbean to, to prepare itself? Anybody can answer that. Yes, Ms. Goodman? You know, we've been working through the Center for Climate and Security and with other uh, U.S. federal agencies and private sector and nonprofit partners to develop plans for Cari increasing Caribbean resilience because we are aware that the combination of extreme weather events combined with the prolonged droughts um, is making the region more fragile. And uh, the, you know, the agencies in the Caribbean, like the CEDEMA, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, and others, are very attentive to that and really want the technologies and the innovation and ingenuity that can be provided across the range of American universities and private sector uh, entities. So I think this is a very fruitful area to continue to push and advance partnerships as we develop the capability to move from reliable weather predictions of seven days into the seasonal, subseasonal forecasting. It's going to be very important in the Caribbean and elsewhere. Well, um, I would continue to hear from the rest of you, but of course, Mr. Connolly will not be very happy as he has already conceded uh, his term. So thank you. Perhaps I can hear from the rest of you in writing. Thank you so much. So Mr. Espiat, you're technically going to uh, yield to, to Mr. Connolly, and we'll give Mr. Connolly his full five minutes. Mr. Connolly. Well, I yield to my good friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Connolly. I thank uh, both the chair and my friend from New York. Um, and thank you all so much for being here. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for having this hearing.
I think it's a critical hearing. And um, Admiral McGinn, I was particularly uh, pleased to hear you say, I think essentially, look, the military are pragmatists. We haven't got time for theoretical debates. And the fact of the matter is we're seeing the consequences of something. Call it climate change, call it whatever you want, but we got to prepare for it. Uh, and I assume, uh, Secretary Goodman, you, you, would con you would concur with that judgment. We need to lead by example. That's right. Now, even in this administration, which continues officially to deny the science of climate change, in a January 2019 DOD report, of the 70, they looked at 79 installations. And in that report, two-thirds of those 79 installations were vulnerable to recurrent flooding, more than a half are vulnerable to drought, about a half are vulnerable to wildfires. Um, and a lot of that clearly is a change. Is it not, uh, I'd ask the two of you, from a military perspective, we obviously didn't build installations knowing they were at risk of flooding, drought, wildfires. Something has happened, something has changed that makes a half to two-thirds of those installations vulnerable. Would that be a fair assessment? It, it is, uh, and it's primarily because the earth is heating up, especially this great big heat sink called the ocean. You hear about El Nino or La Nina, and those effects uh, put more energy into the atmosphere stronger winds, upper air currents, they bring up much more uh, water vapor, and uh, the, the frequency and the intensity of storms that are in this air-ocean interface caused by uh, the, the wick being turned up, if you will, and, and temperature uh, is going to be a continuing phenomenon, and it will affect uh, all, a lot of coastal areas. And as we saw just in the past two hurricane seasons, in the Caribbean and the, uh, and the East Coast, areas that are hundreds of miles uh, inland as well. Admiral, I'm sorry, Ms. Goodman. I just add what that means is that we can no longer fully rely on the historical record to predict what the future will bring. Good point. So historic heat records, flooding, um, storm patterns, have changed and they've sh and they've shifted and so when you want to reset and become more resilient for the future you can't just rely on the past we need to look at at the changing conditions one of the big changes uh particularly affecting your old service Admiral again is of course um the melting of ice sheets so in the arctic you've got floating ice and if it melts it melts it doesn't particularly displace water volume right, because it's already counted floating on the water. But in the Antarctic and in Greenland, significant melting of ice sheets raises global sea levels, does it not? It, it does, in fact. And what could go wrong with that from the Navy's point of view? Well, I think uh, rising uh, sea levels affecting places like uh, Norfolk uh, Naval Station uh, and Naval Air Station Air Force bases in that uh, Tidewater area are good examples. And as uh, Ms. Goodman pointed out earlier, even on uh, sunny day flooding, king tides, et cetera, we're already dealing with that. So um, increasing um, uh, sea level rise because of uh, ice sheets coming off of land masses uh, is going to affect it. More uh, in, in our present danger, if you will, is the intensity and the frequency of storms that cause tidal surge. That isn't directly related to sea level rise, but when you have a six or eight or even 10 foot uh, tidal surge, that is uh, devastating in its power to uh, wipe out infrastructure uh, along the coast. And of course we have the double phenomenon, don't we, in some of these coastal areas, you mentioned Norfolk, where we have rising sea level and we have subsidence of land. And, and, and there the combination are, is really a problem. So location of critical um, backup power systems, for example, are practical things that we can do. If you're going to uh, uh, deploy a, uh, a data center, you don't want to put it in the basement of a building. Uh, you know, you want to put it up on uh, higher ground. You want to think through what is it going to be like when the wind is blowing, when the rain is uh, falling sideways, and flooding is coming in. 
What are the things that have to work, and we can make those engineering and design changes starting now uh, that, uh, that will help us in when, when it is bad? I thank you all, and Mr. Chairman, again, thank you so much for having this thoughtful hearing. I really appreciate it. I know the public does as well. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Ms. Omar. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I wanted to begin um, with uh, a, a response to one of my colleagues earlier who's not here, who'd asked uh, what was the percentage of displacement um, of, of, of people, um, whether what the percentage of it was due to disasters as opposed to conflict, and that percentage is 60%, uh, according to the Internal Displacement uh, Monitoring Center. We know that the, the global refugee crisis really is exasperated, uh, has exasperated uh, been by climate change. And, um, and we don't need to look farther uh, from home. We know this is true. At least 400,000 residents of New Orleans were displaced by Hurricane Katrina. And for, um, but some, and disproportionately, many of those people were uh, black and they were permanently displaced. While climate change is making droughts and famines worse, it's making resources scarcer, making conflicts fiercer, and recession more brutal. Our country is resettling historically low numbers of refugees. And citizens of some of the countries that have been hit hardest by climate change, including Yemen and Iran, Somalia, are currently subject to arbitrary and racist Muslim ban. So Ms. Goodman, you mentioned in your testimony that your parents were refugees. And as you know, I myself am a refugee. Could you tell us a little bit about the importance of American leadership in refugee resettlement, especially from a national security perspective? Specifically, do you agree with me that it is in our nation's security interest to respond to the global refugee crisis, much of which is caused by climate-related factors, with more care than this president um, has been, uh, and what might it look like to you? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Um, yes, my, my mother, uh, who is a Holocaust refugee and is sitting behind me today, um, would not be here but for the open arms uh, of the United States. And uh, she was one of the fortunate few able to escape Germany in the 1930s. Uh, I, so I, I fundamentally believe that it's important for America to be a refuge um, and to, uh, to welcome uh, those who are seeking shelter. That's not to say we, should, we don't need immigration laws uh, and border security. Of course we need that. But we also need to uh, welcome those in need, and particularly when we face the greatest um, wave of refugees since World War II today, many, as you've noted, uh, are fleeing in part because of changes in climate and natural resource scarcities in addition to seeking uh, economic opportunity. I pre appreciate your uh, response. It's uh, one of the American values to, to see ourselves as, as a refuge, and I probably would not have survived if America didn't open its arms to welcome my family. Um, Mr. Uh, Weiserveld, in your testimony, you spoke about the particular vulnerabilities to climate change in the global south. We're seeing this right now with the terrible situation in Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Malawi, where more than 800 people have been killed by the cyclone uh, Idai. There is also a cholera outbreak in Mozambique as a result of the cyclone that has affected more than 200 people. I wanted to read you a quote from a CNN article that was dated on March 31st, uh, and Chairman, I would love to submit that for the record. Without objection. All right. Gaza um, Majel, a former Mozambique Minister of Education and Culture, said to CNN, this is one of the poorest places in the world, which is paying the price of climate change provoked mostly by the developed world. I tend to agree with her. The United States contributes disproportionately 
to the omission of green gases trailed only uh, China in recent years. So it seems to me uh, quite obvious that our domestic consumption and domestic environmental policies are harming our national security by exasperating the effects of climate change. Do you think it's fair to say that it's as a matter of national security, we must take a concerned effort to cut our own green gas emissions? And it is fair to say that this should be an imminent and urgent priority for our country? Thank you very much for the question, Congresswoman, and thank you for highlighting the plight of the people in, in Mozambique and in the southern part of the world who are suffering from this. My experience is in the international development field. I'm not um, someone who's very familiar with the issues of global, global um, carbon emissions. I would say it is, I had the, the privilege earlier in my career to have served in Zimbabwe and have seen some of the areas that are subject to these floods, and I can recall back in the mid-90s driving across Mozambique and seeing that it is, in fact, one of the poorest countries in the world. And it's a great tragedy of climate change that the countries that are the most fragile, where governments are the weakest, where communities are the most vulnerable, are the, the ones who experience the greatest impacts of climate change. And I firmly believe the U.S. people, as, as a country that's, that's very generous, is, is deeply interested in investing in those areas and ensuring that we can take preventative actions using modern technologies to ensure that people have structures and water efficiency and understand water flows so that, that we can mitigate these impacts before they happen. Uh, thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Um, that concludes today's hearing. I again thank our witnesses and all our members for their participation today. The committee stands adjourned. <laughs>